Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce the MIT 150 Symposium on Leaders in Science and Engineering, the Women of MIT. The core of MIT's 150th anniversary celebrations is what comprises the core of MIT, thinkers, students, researchers, and professors talking about great ideas, contemplating the world, and perhaps even making a little progress on some of its problems. Some of the other fo symposia this, this term focus on economics and finance, which occurred in late January, conquering cancer through science and engineering, which was last week, computation and the transformation of our world, which will be in mid-April, the future of exploration in Earth, air, ocean, and space, which will be in late April, and finally, new approaches to the problem intel of intelligence in early May. Of course, these topics in no way cover the full range of the research that goes on at MIT, but they are a very rich sampling of cutting-edge work that epitomizes the best of MIT. I also want to particularly draw your attention to the Next Century Convocation, which is on April 10th, celebrating the actual day of the signing of the Charter. I encourage you all to register online and attend. It's free, and the whole campus, plus alumni, are, involved, are invited. It's sure to be a stupendous once-in-a-lifetime event, a rare opportunity for our entire community to gather to honor scholarship, service, and all the contributions of all the people who comprise MIT. This historic day will renew our sense of belonging to a great institution of accomplishment and purpose. As chair of the MIT 150 Steering Committee, and as an engineer and historian of technology, I've become something of a student of MIT's history, so I want to say a few words about how today's symposium relates to that larger history. In 1853, William Barton Rogers came north from Virginia to pursue his dream of a new kind of technical education that would mix the world of science and the useful arts, theory and practice, what we have come to know as mens et manus, mind and hand. Rogers' vision was actually inclusive. Professors' lectures should be useful to everyone, he wrote, which might draw all the lovers of knowledge of both sexes to the halls of the Institute. As Charles Eliot wrote in 1869 when he was an MIT professor, the graduates of this new institute with this new education would require courage. So much would their preparation differ from those of other leaders in their society with whom they would rub shoulders. No one would require that courage so much as the women of MIT. Indeed, just as Eliot was writing those words, a young woman, Ellen Swallow, was graduating from Vassar College. As she contemplated a career in the science that she loved, she wrote, my life is to be one of active fighting. This spirit suited her well to MIT, of course, which, forward-thinking but still insecure in its early years and very much a product of its time, admitted her with hesitation and off the books as an experiment. She became MIT's first alum in 18, first female, first alumna in 1873, a nerd in the finest MIT tradition. Her husband proposed to her in an MIT laboratory, and they spent their honeymoon visiting mines and collecting ore samples with students in tow. She became, also in the finest MIT tradition, Swallow Richards went on to have an accomplished career in teaching and science. As the founder of home economics, her scientific nutrition helped introduce ideas like calories, protein, and carbohydrates into the American home, where they remain today. She also made major contributions to food science, mineralogy, and industrial chemistry. Among her many other accomplishments, she conducted a comprehensive survey of water quality in Massachusetts that led to the first water quality standards in the United States. Swallow Richards also had great accomplishments in teaching. She opened a women's laboratory at MIT and taught hundreds of women who would not otherwise have had any access to laboratory-based education, MIT's unique trademark. She even conducted correspondence courses to teach women science at home and sent them microscopes in the mail and encouraging them to explore their surroundings. MIT formally began accepting special students, quote, without distinction of sex in 1876. Women were accepted as regular students in 1882. The origins of AMITA, the Association of MIT Alumna, date to 1899 as the MIT Women's Association, of which Richard was, Richards was the first president. 
By 1916, when MIT moved across the river from Boston to Cambridge, more than 600 women in total had attended the institute. But the enrollment had actually declined by then to less than 1% of the student body. And indeed, this is a theme you see running throughout the first 100 years or so of MIT's women, which is outstanding individuals but very small numbers. To be sure, many of these few women were stars with impact far beyond the walls of MIT. For example, Catherine Dexter McCormick, class of 1904, who was a leader in the women's suffrage movement, supported research and development for the birth control pill, and later in life endowed McCormick Hall. It was not until the 20s and the 30s that most MIT departments awarded their first graduate degrees to women. The first women to receive a PhD was in 1922, which you'll be hearing a little bit more about later. Margaret Hutchinson Rousseau, class of 37, received the first doctorate in chemical engineering awarded to a woman in the United States. Between 1940 and 1950, more than 180 degrees were awarded to women, including 23 PhDs. Graduates from this period included Mary Frances Wagley, class of 47 in chemistry, the first woman on the MIT Corporation, the first woman to head the Alumni Association, and MIT life member of the Corporation Emerita. And also, of course, Emily Wade, class of 45, a second woman president of the Alumna Association, and also a corpor corporation life member emerita. Again, though, despite the accomplished individuals, after World War II, the numbers actually went down as men returned from war and took up the slots. By 1964, the percentage of women awarded degrees at MIT remained still at only a few percent, pretty much where it had been in 1916. It would rise to 13% by 1979 and to 45% of undergraduates today. Again, among those small numbers, of course, we find remarkable women, like today's panelist, the Honorable Shirley Ann Jackson. She would graduate in the class of 1968 and in 1973 become the first African-American woman to earn a doctorate in physics when she received her PhD from MIT. The troubling small numbers were not lost on the students. In 1964, the Association of Women Students sponsored a national symposium titled American Women in Science and Engineering. That association and the symposium were headed by the then student Margaret McVicker. Of course, Margaret McVicker would go on to found the Europe program as a 26-year-old junior faculty member, become MIT's first dean of undergraduate education, and is today memorialized in MIT's highest award for undergraduate teaching, the McVicker Fellowships. Yet we can see that 1964 meeting that she and her colleagues organized as something of a predecessor to today's gathering. Yet again, despite stars like Margaret McVicker, the number of women on the faculty remained remarkably few. The first woman professor was nearly at MIT's centennial, Elspeth Rostow, appointed in economics and social science in 1952. And the first female professor in science was Emily Wick, appointed in 1959. It's telling that the first female faculty member in engineering, now Institute Professor Sheila Widnall, appointed in 1964, is still today a very active member of our faculty. The more recent history of the last 50 years and the events leading up to the 1909 report and the one released last week are the subject of today's symposium, and I won't say too much about them. In fact, the people on the panels are really the people who made that history, and I'm sure that at the bicentennial, they will be hailed as the pioneers uh, as MIT celebrates its 200th anniversary. My thanks to professors Cynthia Barnard, Ed Bershinger, Penny Chisholm, Barbara Liskov, Hazel Siv, Ian Waits, and Katrin Wertheim for their willingness to step up and organize this historic gathering, particularly their coordination with the new research results released in last week's report. Nothing could be more exciting for an MIT 150 symposia than to say something new about this critical topic. An indication of the importance of this topic for MIT and for science and engineering in general is that of this organizing committee, we find two associate deans, an associate provost, an institute professor, two department heads, one of whom is now dean. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the MIT 150 staff, led by Gail Gallagher and Ted Johnson, for the stupendous organizational skills in pulling this and so many events, I think we have more than 100 at this point, all together. It's a ple pleasure for me and a privilege to work with them. According to the report last, released last week, the changes that have had the greatest impact in the past 10 years include increasing numbers of women faculty, increasing women faculty in, in the academic administration, including the president of MIT. 
I will now introduce Susan Hockfield, the president of MIT, who not only represents those positive changes, but also has both presided over and enacted many of them herself. She's also provided the leadership and the driving force behind the MIT 150th celebrations, for which I'm deeply grateful. Susan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, David. Uh, David is very generous in his thanks, but um, we really have to thank him because he has given the Institute truly a tremendous gift in his leadership of the entire, and I would say entirely wonderful, MIT 150 celebrations. Uh, you heard it again this morning, what happens when MIT's history is sifted and showcased by a distinguished historian of technology. Um, it is just hugely illuminating. And David, thank you for all your service, including today's window on the role of women in shaping the early history of MIT. I also want to join David in thanking all those who helped bring this symposium to life, the organizers, the panelists, the moderators, and especially our distinguished speakers who have come from great, very great distances to be with us today. I'm really delighted to have you join us. Now, I sometimes say that MIT's job is inventing the future, and today's symposium illustrates this idea in a number of compelling ways. To start with, this symposium stands as a stunning demonstration of science and engineering that go on at MIT. The researchers speaking over the next two days represent the leading edge of inquiry from computing to chemistry, from pure physics to Parkinson's disease. And over the course of this symposium, you will hear from three winners of the National Medal of Science, the nation's highest distinction in science, one winner of the Turing Award, basically the Nobel Prize of computer science, two winners of a MacArthur Genius Award, two Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigators, seven members of the National Academy of Sciences, four members of the National Academy of Engineering, and pioneers who have mapped the surface of Mars, invented a battery self-assembled by viruses, co-discovered the important role of tiny ocean plankton in the global nitrogen cycle, and discovered exoplanet atmospheres that may be compatible with carbon-based life. By adding to the stock of new knowledge in their respective fields, these women, and everyone I just mentioned is a woman, are without question inventing the future. Yet beyond their extraordinary research, they invent the future in other ways too. They're directly engaged in educating the next generation of pioneers in their fields. And at the same time, they serve as inspirational role models for young women and men who seek rewarding lives of discovery and innovation. To borrow a phrase from an illustrious MIT alumna, an extraordinary role model herself, and I quote, education is change. By educating successive generations, you embed change in a living society, inventing the future indeed. And it's our great honor that the author of those words is with us today, Rensselaer's president, Shirley Ann Jackson. And of course, this symposium celebrates and builds on yet another way MIT is helping to invent, invent the future through the Institute's remarkable progress in making our campus a richly supportive environment for women faculty. About 12 years ago, MIT released a report detailing measurable inequities between women on, this, on the faculty in the School of Science and their male colleagues in lab and office space, in compensation, and in opportunities for advancement. Both the report and the decision to release it were signature MIT. Confident, unflinching, and courageous. Confident because of the data, unflinching because of what the data revealed, and courageously committed to solving the problem, not just for MIT, but for the wider world. In the years since, faculty and staff across the Institute have used the report's findings to improve our practices in everything from recruitment to childcare. And just last week, the new report on the status of women faculty in the schools of science and engineering at MIT 
made clear that our persistent efforts have made a transformative difference. The new report delivers the encouraging message that progress is possible, even on such a deeply rooted social issue, and that progress is possible in the space of years, not lifetimes. It also outlines a set of issues that still demand our attention, including improved mentoring and better distribution of institute responsibilities. All this brings me to this morning's symposium simply overwhelming with gratitude to many. First, I want to express our profound thanks to the MIT women faculty who led the groundbreaking charge for equity, spearheaded by Professor Nancy Hopkins, and those who took it upon themselves to conduct the new study as well. Uh, for any of you who really like to see history, you can view Nancy's tape measure among the 150 objects collected at the MIT Museum's exhibition celebrating our sesquicentennial. Second, our thanks go to the women and men who insisted on the changes called for in the original report and to those who have sustained momentum for change since then. In particular, I want to thank our guests, former Dean of Science Bob Bergino and former MIT President Chuck Vest for facing the very difficult message of the original report and for acting on those findings. We also owe a huge bouquet of thanks to Provost Raphael Reif for his determined and relentless efforts over the last almost six years to advance the care, the cause of equity and inclusion. His efforts take forms large and small, from insisting on broadened faculty searches and appointing the Institute's first associate provost for faculty equity, to listening very closely to hear even the whispers of discomfort and rapidly acting on them. Raphael's unswerving vigilance has kept these issues front and center and is responsible in large part for MIT's success in retaining and hiring so many outstanding women faculty. Together in the classic MIT spirit of can-do problem solving, these institute leaders have produced results that are both practically useful and personally exhilarating for women in science and engineering at MIT and around the world. I want to offer one last personal thank you. As a neuroscientist, I am, like many of you, a woman in science. I lead an institution that includes hundreds of women scientists and engineers of every age. I also have a daughter who, like many of her friends, is a young woman preparing for a life in science. I want to thank all of those who have worked so hard to make our institutions places where no one questions a woman's right to choose this path, nor their right to fair treatment every step of the way. Above all, thank you for inspiring them and the women around the world with the power and possibility shown by your work in engineering and science. It is truly a gift to the world. David mentioned Ellen Swallow Richards, the first great pioneer for women at MIT. Her example as a superb researcher, a brilliant student, a brilliant teacher, and a tireless advocate for women rings out in the lives of the remarkable leaders we'll hear from today. Ellen Swallow Richards used to sign her letters with two words, keep thinking. I'm confident that if we keep thinking, Together, MIT will continue to earn its reputation for inventing the future, a brighter, more fascinating, more equitable future for all. Thank you very much for being with us today. And now I have the pleasure of introducing to you someone who, by example, demonstrates how an individual can help advance equity and inclusion. Professor Ed Birchinger, head of the Department of Physics. His mentorship includes a blog on MIT's diversity website and his chairmanship of this symposium. Through both, he has articulated the importance of diversity and inclusion in science and engineering. A member of the MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research, 
He leads a research program studying dark energy and dark matter. Our Department of Physics is among the world's top-ranked physics departments for both research and teaching. Professor Birchinger believes that to amplify the department's impressive reputation, it must actively reach out to underrepresented minorities and women. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Ed Birchinger. Thank you very much, President Hockfield and David Mindell, for your moving remarks that help put in context this historic occasion. I want to add my thanks as well to the Institute staff who helped put together these symposia. Ted Johnson, the Director of Institute Events, Conference Services Manager Kathy Levine, Allison Newman, and especially Physics Events Coordinator Nina Wu, whose hard work, all of them, made this symposium come together. I also want to add my thanks to my fellow uh, organizing committee members, Cindy Barnhart, Penny Chisholm, and Ian Waits from Engineering, uh, Hazel Siv and Ketrin Wareheim from the School of Science, and Barbara Liskoff, Institute Professor. Uh, their advice and input and encouragement in putting together this symposium and in uh, combining it with the report that was mentioned were uh, critical in bringing together this event, and I am looking forward to celebrating uh, with them. I want to thank Dean Mark Kastner and Dean Ian Waits and his predecessor, Subra Suresh, for their financial support and encouragement of this symposium. A couple of program notes. There are 30-minute uh, breaks in the morning and in the afternoon each day. I would ask the attendees to return uh, promptly from them so that we can keep on schedule as best we can. And uh, today at lunch, lunch will be served for, with boxes available for those who uh, pre-registered and obtained the tickets on the second floor of the Student Center, uh, where we will celebrate with the family of Dr. Elizabeth Gatewood, MIT's first female PhD awarded in chemistry in 1922. Over a year ago, the organizing committee set about preparing a symposium to celebrate the success of women in science and engineering at MIT, with the understanding that MIT's leadership in recognizing and confronting its problems of gender bias and discrimination was a landmark. While the story of MIT's response was historic, Another measure of MIT's success is in the accomplishments of a growing number of women faculty members. This symposium presents an outstanding set of accessible talks by leaders in science and engineering. We are fortunate to have these stars and many others on our faculty. And I'm personally delighted that every MIT speaker who was invited accepted the invitation and is here to speak at the symposium. In addition to the science talks, we will hear from very distinguished speakers about the impact of MIT's leadership across the nation, as well as our need to continue improvements towards full equity. Many of the ideas that will be discussed have been raised by our own women faculty in a report commissioned specifically for this symposium, which you have picked up along with the program. That report is a follow-up to the 1999 and 2002 reports on women faculty in science and engineering. I thank all of the women who contributed to the new report, and especially Hazel Siv and Lorna Gibson, who chaired the science and engineering sections. 